Now, you used to um, have a senior job at Yahoo for many years. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a sort of contract gig hosting a show at Yahoo. So I was on at the headquarters a couple days a week for a year or so. And it, what struck me, one thing that struck me about Yahoo is how wrapped up in the stock price a lot of people at the company were. And mm -hmm. I think that that had to do with it going public in the you know, dot-com days mm -hmm. when we, every place had CNBC on. Right. And I think there were like the stock price was like on the printers mm -hmm. and some of the buildings. Um, I mean, so you've seen firsthand like how an, an unhealthy obsession with stock price can hurt a company, I imagine. Um, are there things that you've learned from your experience at Yahoo that you really took into this experience now that LinkedIn is the darling? I mean, Yahoo was the darling at one point in time. Certainly isn't now. You were kind of there somewhere in between. Yeah, uh, Yahoo was an invaluable experience for a number of reasons. Not only learning um, what to do and how to replicate some of the success, but also learning um, how to improve upon certain things. Um, in, in the category of what to do, one of the things I drew from Yahoo was scale. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're managing products that reach on the consumer side over half a billion people on a global basis, you're constantly thinking about how to massively scale um, your infrastructure, uh, the products and services, your value propositions to the largest audience possible. Mm -hmm. And that just changed your mindset. It, it changes the way you approach things. And I think um, that has certainly served us well here. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that was most challenging at Yahoo um, was focus, or at times the lack thereof, because the very same value proposition that Yahoo was founded upon, which was really organizing the entire web, mm -hmm. becomes very, very challenging to continue to execute when you have all of these competitors in various verticals where they're focused on one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think one of the things that you draw from that is the importance of focus and reinforcing that time and time again. And at LinkedIn, as is the case with Yahoo and any other company, I think the more success you have over time, the more you're scaling, the more opportunities you have. Mm -hmm. And it requires even more discipline to remain focused on your core value prop. And for us, it's connecting talent with opportunity at massive scale. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do, day in and day out. That's where we're focused. Mm -hmm. Are you guys worth $10 billion? I'll leave that to the markets to decide. <laughs> we, in, in all seriousness, you know, we're very focused on a long-term plan here. And uh, we're certainly very pleased with the progress we've made thus far to date. Uh, but we're just getting started. Either way you slice it, that is a big market cap based on the revenues you're doing. A lot of companies, when they have that kind of market cap, um, see it as the perfect opportunity to go buy things. Mm -hmm. We certainly are seeing a flood of startups that are trying to disrupt LinkedIn that are saying, LinkedIn is eight years old, you know, LinkedIn doesn't get certain things, trying to pick off different parts of your company. Are you seeing things out there that you want to buy? I know you guys have done some acquisitions. Yeah, we've done three acquisitions to date. They've been on the smaller side, largely oriented towards uh, accelerating things that were already in the roadmap, um, areas like mobile relevancy behind LinkedIn today and some talent acquisitions as well, um, adding some great people to the team. Uh, I think uh, we certainly do have our eyes on um, particular segments of what we do. And again, anything that we believe can accelerate a, a priority on the roadmap, um, specifically oriented around um, creating value for the membership, things that will enable us to generate greater relevancy. Mm -hmm. um, mobile is certainly an area of interest for us. Uh, mobile is our fastest growing consumer service right now. It's up 400% year over year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see some really interesting things from us along those lines. Um, and certainly anything that would be accretive to the top or bottom line and help deliver more value for our customers uh, are things we keep an eye on as well. So uh, we're going to continue to evaluate the landscape, uh, but it's not that we have a, a growth through acquisition strategy. It's mm -hmm. going to continue to be buy, build versus partner and whatever makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Um, there was so much debate around you guys going public, and there was so much commentary of people saying that, you know, that this was opening up the market and it was, you know, this watershed moment. Now anyone could go public and it's a great opportunity. Um, I was talking to Peter Thiel the other day, who's mm. obviously good friends with Reed yeah. and had a lot of history with LinkedIn. And his theory was actually kind of the opposite. Mm. He thinks what LinkedIn proved actually was that, y you know, it's great if you're a five to ten billion dollar, you know, market cap company. But for everyone else, it's still pretty hard to go public. Um, what's your view? You know, it's, I think it's a really interesting question. My view is going to be heavily colored by the experience we just went through. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we very thankfully have uh, an amazing team that, uh, in, you know, on the GNA side, finance, legal, communications, that helped us navigate that process in a way that was minimally disruptive to the company. I think that's borne out in the results that you just saw from this quarter. And, uh, again, the... Um, the overall impact has, has really been um, immaterial in terms of changing the day-to-day -day culture and the way we approach our business is business as usual. Uh, I think there are clearly benefits, uh, you know, whether or not that's 
um, liquidity uh, for existing shareholders and ultimately for employees. Uh, a universally understood valuation uh, that can be applied to your currency uh, for acquisitions or cash to strengthen your balance sheet. Uh, you know, they say the best time to raise money is when you don't need it. And, right. um, you know, very fortunately we were in a position where we didn't need the capital. Uh, but you certainly think about the macroeconomic environment and how uncertain it's, it's growing. And uh, it, it's nice to have a strong balance sheet. So those are some of the considerations. But I think every company has to evaluate it differently. At the end of the day, they have to answer one question that I think is far more important than any other, which is are you ready? Because you can go down the list of the, the benefits and the potential costs, but none of it means anything if you're rushing to get to market. If you're not ready, it probably doesn't make sense. How do you know when you're ready? In our case, uh, we have an incredibly talented CFO named Steve Sordello, and he put together the <laughs> most some sort of bell. <laughs> comprehensive um, uh, readiness checklist. Uh -huh. So as we originally began the dialogue about what it meant to be public, we wanted to take it from the subjective to the objective. And so uh, we would bring that out and review it with the board from time to time. And uh, it was so effective that we had heard from uh, board members and some other folks, can they get a copy of the template? Uh, mm -hmm. He did a wonderful job with that. But at the end of the day, it's not about checklists, and it's not about um, checking boxes. Mm -hmm. it, it's about knowing. Mm -hmm. um, is your infrastructure going to scale? Mm -hmm. Are your processes going to scale? And most importantly, are your people going to scale? You have the right team in place. And um, if you've got that core value prop, if you know what you're about, and you're on, on the right trajectory, um, I think it can certainly be a good thing. Does it make sense to you that people are lumping LinkedIn's IPO with Pandora's IPO, with Zillow's IPO, mm -hmm. with Home? I mean, it seems like anything that has you know a, a website as its core business is all being lumped in one category I mean, it seems to me linkedin's a very different company than a lot of those yes and uh <laughs> and we're a professional network we focus on the the professional realm and professional context exclusively that's very different from say pandora uh, which is a pure play digital media company solely focused on music that's their core focus and one of the reasons they've uh, performed so well to date I, I think there's always a tendency for people to want to categorize things to make right. sense of them and there was Web 1.0. Right. And but the web was new then. Yeah. The well, web is kind of in everything now, isn't it? But in a sense, um, there is a, there's something new about 2.0. There's something new about these social platforms. There's something new about the way we've developed infrastructure that connects hundreds of millions of people around the world in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Or the way people now go online and share their identity. Or connect with other people to build their networks. Uh, or share just about everything under the sun. I mean, if mm -hmm. you predicted... Uh, everyone would be behaving the way they are today 10 years ago on the web. Right. People would have looked at you like, what are you, crazy? So it is new. There is a newness and there's a sense that uh, it can truly improve the way the world lives, the way it plays, in the case of LinkedIn, the way it works. Mm -hmm. So I understand that categorization, but I do think each company needs to be evaluated independently. Mm -hmm. So last question, and I mean this is incredibly self-serving because it's something that's stunned us at TechCrunch. Why are your share buttons working so well? Because, like, yeah. I mean, I remember, like, years ago talking to Reed. I think it was, like, one of the ten times he came back in as CEO. And, you know, he was saying that, like, one of the biggest things LinkedIn struggled with from his view was um, was giving people enough things to do on the site. And, you know, they always have these features. And you always saw LinkedIn doing these things. And, like, you know, sometimes it stuck. Sometimes it really didn't. But, like, so when it came to share buttons, I thought, well, like, everyone has share buttons. Right. Like, I, I tend to think of LinkedIn as sort of this AAA card in the back of your wallet when you – you know, need a, something I probably shouldn't be laughing at that joke. <laughs> we're, we're a lot more than that. <laughs> but, um, but so I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go on LinkedIn to mm. share things. But, I mean, you guys bring more traffic to our site than Twitter. Uh, well, that's probably in reference to Twitter.com because mm -hmm. Twitter is a mobile uh, site and, and Twitter clients. And I think, a lot of tweets are linked or are in, in We have an integration right. play. But Twitter's driving tons right. of traffic to the web. I, I think independent of but that. But to even be in that conversation. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I think, surprising. I, I think the, uh, the short answer to the question is I think we're meeting an unmet need. Uh, and you, you look at the way in which professionals would gather business intelligence or the headlines they need to be reading. And there really wasn't a mechanism to provide the kind of relevancy we could. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a matter of minutes, you can scan the most relevant headlines you need uh, to make better decisions faster. And at the end of the day, that's one of the most important things that goes into making you more productive and successful. Why can we do that? We can do that because we have some understanding of who you are, what you do, um, your skills, your interests, your company. Uh, perhaps more importantly, we know your network. We know who you're connected to. And so uh, by virtue of understanding what they're sharing, what they're reading, 
uh, we can apply that professional lens to create greater relevancy. Mm -hmm. And then you get the ecosystem dynamics. The more business publishers we announced today, over 100,000 business sites on the web have added the, the, the plugin. And so the more publishers that are putting these buttons up, the more sharing taking place, the more sharing coming into LinkedIn, the greater the liquidity, the more likely we can create a more relevant experience. Mm -hmm. And round and round that goes. Mm -hmm. And so we've been very pleased with that effort. Um, it's still in its early days, but uh, you're going to see more from us along those lines. It's interesting because I feel like LinkedIn has always been based on this premise that um, you know, certainly reads First Insight, um, having tried to do a dating site before, that you, know, you have these different spheres for who you are. Mm -hmm. And there's your sort of personal sphere, your family sphere, your professional sphere, yep. and that you want separation. Yep. Well, we've certainly seen a lot of times um, both Twitter and Facebook have sort of run counter to that theory. Mm -hmm. And there's always been these stories about will these things kill LinkedIn? There's more job recruiting going on on Facebook, whatever. Um, I mean, it sounds like the way you describe sort of the success of the share button, LinkedIn is still a big believer that people want that separation. There, there's no question. I, I think context matters. And one of the things that we find interesting when we go out, we do member meetups throughout the world in various cities. And uh, no matter if you're in Mumbai or Amsterdam or San Francisco, uh, we hear time and time again people want to keep, for the most part, their professional lives and their personal lives separate. You're going to see overlap. Uh, and I think uh, the reason we're able to add as much value as we are with the exclusive focus on professionals is really twofold. One, people want a sense that they can control what they're sharing with whom and when, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Two, and perhaps uh, even more importantly, is the relevancy that we can create by having that purest signal. All we focus on is professional right. content. So by that token, is there any reason for my retired in-laws to be on LinkedIn? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, multiple <laughs> reasons, not the least of which is uh, they may be interested in mentoring uh, people mm -hmm. just coming up through the ranks, uh, providing opportunities for them. Uh, They've I'm got not a grandson sure. coming. They don't care about that. Okay, but uh, <laughs> you know, we're in the process of rolling out a volunteer field uh -huh. uh, on the LinkedIn profile and uh, very interested in uh, pr creating opportunities for our professionals to be able to give back, whether that's their time, energy, or resources. And so um, imagine a platform where we get philanthropic organizations uh, suggesting they need help in certain areas and then our professionals can can volunteer their time and energy mm -hmm. um, so maybe they want to take advantage of that I will pass it on but right. I have a feeling they're just getting they're getting picture frames ready now. <laughs> that's all they're doing okay um, thank you so much for making time for us and congratulations on a good first quarter thank you